I have uh, just a little bit after eight, so why don't we just begin? I'd like to welcome you all here. I'm glad uh, you came out on this semi-misty night, such a beautiful day, and I'd like to thank you for coming. Our guest speaker tonight, Monsignor George Higgins, is currently a professor of social ethics at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. From 1944 until his retirement in 1980, he worked with the National Conference of Catholic Bishop in urban affairs and labor issues. He is well known for his work with the labor movement, and during the past 11 years, he has been the unofficial advisor to the U.S. Catholic bishops on labor issues. He has also lectured widely on Catholic social teaching, especially as it treats issues of labor unionism. There will be a short time after Monsignor Higgins' talk for questions. I would like to introduce Monsignor George Higgins. slight confusion in the title of the talk as listed on your program, or at least on the program that I was just handed. It reads, Justice in America and the U.S. Catholic Church. That covers an awful lot of ground, <laughs> and I don't intend to speak to that subject. Before John Donahue went to Salvador in our occasional exchange of letters, it was my understanding he wanted me to speak about the, uh, the 100th anniversary of Catholic social teaching going back to Verum Novarum of 1891. And that's what I intend to do from my own vantage point, from the point of view of my own experience. I will try to leave enough time for questions because it is my experience, has, has always been my experience, that when people come to lectures, they really don't come to listen to the lecture. They come to say, make statements of their own afterwards, <laughs> either in the form of questions or straight statements. So I'll try to give you time for that. As Ken uh, has already informed you, I spent most of my life working in the bureaucracy at the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, formerly known as the National Catholic Welfare Conference. So I will be speaking against that background. Um, looking back 50 years, halfway back to Rerum Novarum, I'm struck first of all by the fact that we now tend to approach the social encyclicals and other relevant church documents with a greater sense of historical consciousness than we used to do and we're less inclined to exegete them Talmudically than was formerly the case. My former colleague, Father John Cronin, whose name may be familiar to some of you, the older ones in the crowd, who in years gone by was the preeminent popularizer of Catholic social teaching in the United States, touched upon this point 20 years ago in his own published recollections about the reception in the United States of the encyclical Quadrigesimo Anno of 1931 and related documents. It never occurred to us, Cronin wrote, that these documents were both historically and culturally conditioned. We realized that Quadrigesimo Anno was clearly addressed to the major industrial areas of the world, but it did not occur to us how much of the mindset was Italian and Germanic. Most of us had never heard of form criticism, and probably we would not have dared to use it on documents of the Magisterium, even if we had known what it meant. That's not true today. If time permitted, permitted, I could confirm Cronin's point by citing examples from my own experience, and more to the point by citing some of the mistakes that I have personally made in this regard. But for present purposes, suffice it to say that even a casual survey of scholarly commentaries on Rerum Novarum in several different languages clearly validates Cronin's argument. If nothing else, my own reading or rereading in recent months of a representative sampling of these commentaries and historical studies clearly demonstrates that it is impossible to understand Leo's encyclical or any of the more recent documents without examining the historical context within which and often in response to which the documents were written. Failure to examine the documents in their historical setting has led some to exaggerate their strengths and others to exaggerate their weaknesses and has also led even scholars of some repute to find a greater degree of unbroken continuity between the successive documents than the facts would seem to warrant. 
Curiously, one of the better commentaries on the historical development of Catholic social teaching from Leo until recent times was written 15 or 20 years ago by a non-Catholic historian, Richard L. Kemp, in a book entitled The Papal Ideology of Social Reform. Professor Kemp, who was a sympathetic critic of the encyclicals, starting with Ram Navarum, finds a distinct evolution in papal social teaching, which in his view cannot be explained simply as an effort on Leo's successor's part to bring him up to date. In short, he thinks that it is naive to exaggerate the strengths of Ram Navarum and equally naive to find too much continuity in Catholic social teaching. On the other hand, his refined sense of historical consciousness prompts him, even when he is pointing to weaknesses in Ram Navarum, to give due credit to Leo XIII for the document's strengths. Specifically, for example, he argues at one point, as many of today's neoconservative critics of Catholic social teaching are also want to do, Michael Novak, for example, that Leo XIII and some of his successors place too much emphasis on the distribution of wealth and not enough on the need for greater productivity. But even here, his criticism of Ram Navarum is tempered by his understanding of the historical context in which Leo was writing. No one can deny, he says, that the distribution of wealth was in fact a very serious problem in Leo's time, and no knowledgeable person would argue today that the workers' place in society in 1891, or their share of the national wealth, was satisfactory even in England or the United States or other advanced industrial nations. Rerum Novarum, he concludes, met these issues directly and proposed a balanced, pragmatic blueprint for the regeneration of the proletariat within existing economic institutions, which could enable the laborer to take his place as a dignified member of society. He saw the need for the church to speak for the working man, and he inspired Catholics to make work the workers' cause their own. Had he done nothing else, his place in history as a great pope would still have been secure. Many other critics of Ram Novarum and more recent papal documents have echoed, echoed Professor Camp's argument that these documents pay too much attention to the distribution of wealth and not enough to the need for greater productivity. That's fair enough. But by and large, these critics today are loath to say loud and clear that even today, as in 1891, the distribution of wealth remains an extremely serious problem, and the economic condition of any workers and their share of the national wealth, even in the most advanced industrial nations, including our own, is far less than satisfactory. I'm intrigued by the fact that the neoconservatives, and I read them as widely as time permits, love to talk about capitalism as a theoretical construct particularly since the new encyclical Centes Masonis, which they read as giving a, a blessing to capitalism, but they say little, in my experience at least, about the practical workings of capitalism in the United States today. Examining Rerum Novarum in its historical context also serves to remind us that the encyclical was received differently in different nations because of their different histories and traditions and cultures. To cite but one example, Catholics on the continent of Europe in 1891 were badly divided over the issue of so-called Christian or Catholic versus so-called neutral trade unions. This debate, which carried over onto the continent well into the 20th century, never caught fire in the United States. We have never had any division in the, in the American labor movement along the lines of religion. In Europe, it was customary, it was almost universal up until the Second World War. We've never had it here. It never caught fire here, thanks to the leadership, in part at least, of Cardinal Gibbons of Baltimore and several of his fellow bishops in warding off a threatened papal condemnation of the old Knights of Labor, which was the leading federation of labor in the United States in the latter part of the 19th century. From the time of Gibbons to the present day, Catholic workers in the United States have been free to belong to neutral unions and have belonged to them in numbers in excess of their proportion of the population, and no attempt has ever been made to establish exclusively Catholic or so-called Christian unions. Monsignor John Tracy Ellis, who lives, did live until very recently on the campus where I reside, who, as you know, is the, the dean of American Catholic historians, has said more than once in my hearing that the intervention of Gibbons and his fellow bishops at that time, the document which they sent to Rome to prevent a condemnation of the Knights of Labor, may well have been the most important single document in the history of the American church. I tend to agree with that conclusion though, as a non-historian for the simple reason that had the Knights of Labor been condemned, 
two things I think were, would have been predictable. One is that a very small proportion of the Catholic workers would have, in obedience to Rome, would have left the Knights of Labor and probably would have tried to form some kind of sectarian Catholic or Christian union, which would have been very weak, which would have divided the labor movement very badly. The other more probable scenario is, I think, that a large proportion of the Catholic workers would have ignored the ruling from, from Rome and would have gone their own way and gradually been disaffected from the church, as happened in a widespread manner in Europe. As Father John Polakowski, professor of social ethics at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, has pointed out in his own commentary on Rome of Arm, the most direct and lasting effect of the encyclical in this country was the impetus it gave to unionization. He points out that although a few American bishops like Gibbons and Archbishop Ireland of St. Paul had already given their blessing to unionization and Catholics were already active in union leadership, Rerum Navarum opened the doors to a much more massive and intensive collaboration between American Catholicism and the labor movement. This one example, which I will take up again in a moment another, in another context, can serve to substantiate Father John Coleman's argument Coleman is a professor of religious sociology at Berkeley in a brilliant essay on the development of Catholic social teaching. His argument that despite all of the theoretical arguments pro and con about the historical strengths and limitations of Rerum Novarum and more recent encyclicals, it is important to note that the encyclicals tended to be read, absorbed, and commented on mainly by socially involved Catholics who generally gave them a more progressive interpretation than their location in historical context might have warranted. The encyclicals then, he says, represent in some sense a genuine unified tradition of humane social thought which we both celebrate today and try to bring forward into the future. Coleman himself is critical of the encyclicals on several scores, but in the end he concludes that ultimately the future of this tradition will depend less on our ability to parrot its significant terms and more on our ability to read the signs of the times in fidelity to the gospel as Leo and his successors tried to do in their times. History, he says, will surely unveil all too well our shortcomings. May it also, as it does for this legacy of the Pope, show our prophetic vision and courageous action. It would be difficult, I think, to think of a better way of stating the lesson to be learned by today's Catholics as we go about celebrating the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum. My second observation, based again on my own experience, has to do with the changing relationship since and mainly because of Vatican II between the Holy See and the local churches, the church in the United States, for example, in the area of Catholic social teaching and Catholic social action. Let me illustrate this point in an oversimplified manner by recalling that between 1944, when I first joined the staff of the Social Action Department of the old National Catholic Welfare Conference, the predecessor of the present NCCB, between 44 and the end of Vatican II in 1965, there was literally no contact of any kind <clears throat> between our department of the conference and the Holy See. I do not recall that we ever exchanged at any time even so much as a letter, a cablegram, or a phone call. That is obviously no longer the case. At the present time, the church in the United States is routinely in contact with the Holy See and its several congregations. I would imagine almost on a weekly basis and perhaps even more frequently. The participation of Cardinal Casseroli, the former Secretary of State, at a Verum Novarum conference at Notre Dame a few months ago, and the participation of Cardinal Echegaray, the President of the Pontifical Council on Justice and Peace, at another Rerum Novarum observance in Washington, only served to symbolize this new and potentially promising relationship between the local church and the Holy See, this new expression of collegiality in the extended sense of that word. This changing relationship, which reflects in its own way a new and better post-Vatican II understanding of ecclesiology, invites, involves more than simply a new style and new forms of communication at the bureaucratic level, between the local churches and the Holy See. It runs deeper than that. It involves the local churches, to some extent at least, in the very process of developing Catholic social teaching. You may recall that Paul VI, in his Apostolic Letter of 1971, Dr. Advenians on the 80th anniversary of Round of Arm, broke radically new ground in this regard. Dr. Advenians was written in the form of a familiar dialogue, not only with Catholics or with Christians in general, 
but with all those of goodwill and carefully avoids the more pontifical style of teaching which so often characterized similar documents in the not too distant past. On some matters, of course, Paul stated his own convictions firmly, but never in such a way as to force his opinion on the reader or to short circuit or foreclose the dialogue. On matters which are purely contingent, those open to varying viewpoints, which lend themselves to a variety of solutions, he carefully refrained from trying to say or even leaving the impression that he was trying to say the last and final word. Indeed, he went out of his way to emphasize that it was neither his ambition nor his mission to utter a unified message and to put forward a solution which would have universal validity. His purpose, he said, was the more modest one of confiding his own thoughts and preoccupations about some, but by no means all, of today's more pressing social problems and of encouraging individual Catholics and groups of Catholics in dialogue with other Christians and all other people of goodwill to analyze with objectivity the situation which is proper to their own country and in addition to discern the options and commitments which are called for in order to bring about the social, political, and economic changes which seem in many cases to be needed. I might pause here for a moment to say that it was this particular section of Dr. Jason Madvanian's which made it much easier, made it almost inevitable for the U.S. bishops in 1986 to issue their own pastoral on conditions in the United States. They weren't speaking about the Philippines or about Europe, but in the spirit of Dr. Jason Madvanian's, we're saying we as leaders of the church, teachers in the church in this country, look at our own economy in the light of Catholic social teaching and in the light of our own tradition and come to the following conclusions. One is reminded here of Pope John XXIII's distinctively pastoral style of teaching by Paul's repeated emphasis in several different contexts on the legitimate variety or plurality of possible options which are open to people of goodwill. His related emphasis on the obligation of individual Catholics to form their own conscience on these matters in the light of the gospel message, but without waiting for directives from their ecclesiastical leaders. It goes without saying, of course, that the full implications of Dr. J's Madvanians have yet to be worked out in practice. By way of example, does it follow logically from Dr. J's Madvanians that there ought to be a more systematic input from the local churches in the drafting of social encyclicals and other universal church documents on Catholic social teaching? This is an old question, a question to which even with the best of goodwill and even under optimum conditions, there is, it seems to be, no easy answer, given the diversity and complexity of problems confronting a church which today is truly universal in its geographical sweep and spread. In any event, it's an intriguing question and one which I suspect will continue to crop up from time to time. It is, as I say, an old question. Even before Vatican II, it was raised by, among others, the late Father Georges Jarlot, a French Jesuit scholar who for many years taught Catholic social teaching at the Gregorian University in Rome. Father Jarlot, a native of France, can hardly be accused of prejudice when he said, even before Vatican II, that the Church's social doctrine prior to the Council, prior to Vatican II, was inevitably European, and even like Pope John the 23rd's two encyclicals, Italian. His specific reference to John's encyclicals, Mater et Magistra and Pacem Interis, is to me somewhat surprising. For of all the social encyclicals since Leo's Rerum Novarum, these two seem to me to be, at least, to be the least European, or if you will, the most universal in style as well as in content. But whatever of that, Father Jarlow's overall characterization of the Church's social doctrine prior to the Council is valid. My third observation, again at the bureaucratic level, has to do with the increasing willingness of the Holy See to encourage the local churches to play a more active international role in support of social justice and human rights. Again, let me cite my own experience at the old NCWC to illustrate the point I'm making here. It is my clear recollection that during my first 20 years on the staff of the old NCWC, that is between 1944 and the end of the Council, Rome expected the conference, the old National Catholic Welfare Conference, to work exclusively within the continental borders of the United States. I'm exaggerating a bit, but while a certain amount of significant international work was done by the conference in those days, mainly through the initiative of the late Father Raymond McGowan, one of the unsung heroes of the Catholic Social Acts Movement in the United States, this work was in a sense bootleg activity and was tolerated, the tolerated exception to the general rule that the local churches were expected to leave it to Rome to take the initiative in the field of international relations. 
That's no longer true. Our own National Conference of Catholic Bishops, U.S. Catholic Conference, is now deeply involved in international affairs with the encouragement and blessing of the Holy See. The fact that your own colleague John Donahue is down in El Salvador is another expression of the involvement of Americans, particularly in Central America, in recent years. That's something new. That did not happen before Vatican II. There was very little of that. Now it's almost routine. I am speaking here, of course, mainly about changes at the bureaucratic level. At the substantive level, needless to add, the church universal and the local churches are also more extensively and intensively involved in the field of international social justice than ever before. The content of Catholic social teaching before John XXIII was, by and large, concerned almost exclusively with the social and economic problems of individual nation states. Not so today. I will say no more about this except to add that socially speaking, and quite apart from sociologically speaking, and quite apart from any theological considerations, the role of the Petrine office has taken on in some respects more importance than ever before in modern history. At times this may go down hard with Americans, for even in our better moments, witness the unashamedly self-patriotic rhetoric of a typical State of the Union message, we are probably more provincial and less cosmopolitan than we generally are willing to admit. In recent years, in the specific field of Catholic social teaching, for example, it has become fashionable in some American circles to complain a bit too peevishly for my taste that the Holy See has been slow to recognize and to learn from the American political and economic experience. That's standard fare in the neoconservative camp. There's a certain merit to this complaint, but to overdo it would be to run the risk, I think, of being perceived by intelligent observers in other countries, rich and poor alike, as innocents abroad in a very complex world society. In short, I think we would be well advised to take to heart the cautionary words which the very cosmopolitan Cardinal Lecce Garay addressed ever so courteously to the several hundred delegates attending the NCCB observance of the centenary of Rome Novarum. The entire world, the Cardinal said, cannot be reduced to the United States. It is timely, I think, to raise this point at the present time in view of the fact that a controversy has already been stirred up about Pope John Paul II's recent encyclical, Cinzes Musanus, issued in May on the 100th anniversary of Aaron Navarum. There's been a, an argument in the press ever since that document came out as to what extent the document blesses the American style of democratic capitalism, or to what extent it does not. It's a legitimate argument, but I would hope that it could be carried on less polemically than it has been in recent months. Let me wrap up these random recollections with some hurried remarks about a few of what I consider to be the unresolved problems in, in the United States in our implementation of Catholic social teaching. In my opinion, for whatever it may be worth, we have yet to understand in all of its implications the principle of subsidiarity and the co-relative principle of solidarity or socialization, both of which taken in tandem are of central importance in the corpus of modern Catholic social teaching. First, a word about the principle of subsidiarity with its emphasis on the central importance of non-governmental mediating institutions or structures in our economy. In my judgment, while rightly giving due prominence to the role of such mediating structures and organizations, we have tended to do so by and large negatively by stressing very one-sidedly their obvious importance as bulwarks against statism and have yet to agree upon a positive and structured role for these organizations in the operation and planning of the economy. That is to say, I think we have yet to come to terms, for example, with John Paul II's treatment of this subject in his earlier encyclical Laborum Exertions on human labor. Laborum Exertions speaks quotes of a wide range of intermediate bodies with economic purposes, enjoying real autonomy with regard to the public powers and pursuing their aims in honest collaboration with each other and in subordination to the demands of the common good. It is my clear impression that many of those in the United States who rightly stress the importance of these intermediate bodies tend to see them as being parallel to the corporate structures in the domestic and world economy and do not really envisage them as being institutionally involved as autonomous bodies with economic purposes in the economic decision-making progress process of either individual nations or of the world community of nations. That's particularly true in my judgment with regard to the attitude of the neoconservatives and the conservatives in our country towards unions. Surely among all the mediating structures in our society, 
in the economic field. Unions are of prime importance. But you can read extensively in new conservative and conserv conservative literature, and you might find, you will find, high praise for the Polish labor movement, solidarity. You'll find little praise and little support for American unions at a time when the trade union movement in the United States is just hanging on by its teeth. Subject to correction, I am personally inclined to think that this limited anti-statism under, under understanding of the role of intermediate structures accounts at least to some extent for the mass of it, in my view, menacing lack of concern in conservative circles about the growing weakness of American unions. I regret to say it, but the silence of the conservative community in the United States on this issue has been thunderous in recent years. Robert Nisbet, who I suppose would call himself neoconservative, is one of the few conservative social and political philosophers who strongly laments the decline of organized labor in the United States. But even he tends to think of unions one-sidedly as powerful forces in support of capitalism and as bulwarks against political invasion of economic freedom. In his book, The Quest for Community, published originally in 58, but recently made available again in a new edition, Nisbet writes that the labor union and cooperative are foremost among new forms of association that have served to keep alive the symbols of economic freedom as such. It should be remarked, he says, that they have been the first objects of economic destruction in totalitarian countries. The individual entrepreneur, it may be observed, is less dangerous to the, to the totalitarian than the labor union. But in such an for in such an association, the individual can find a sense of relatedness to the entire culture and thus becomes its eager partisan. Nisbet goes on to say that the mythology of individualism continues to reign in this country in discussions of economic freedom. By too many partisans of management, he says, the labor union is regarded as a major obstacle to economic autonomy and as a partial paralysis of capitalism. But to weaken, whether from political or individualistic motives, the social structure of the family, the local community, labor unions, or the industrial community is to convert a culture into an atomized mass. Such a mass, he says, will have neither the will nor the incentive nor the ability to combat tendencies toward political collectivism. These are welcome words coming as they do from a leading American conservative or neoconservative social philosopher and coming at a time when some of the most influential employer organizations in the United States are insistently calling for a union-free environment and gleefully, as in the case of the United States Chamber of Commerce, predicting the demise of the American labor movement. Now that the Iron Curtain has come down, it is time for scholars of Nisbet stature in the conservative community to stress not only the negative role of unions as bulwarks against statism, but also their positive role in the proper ordering of economic life in the United States. I suspect that we may have tended to shy away from this problem for fear of being accused of hankering unrealistic and, and ahistorically for some outmoded, outmoded form of European corporativism, a subject which, because it was widely confused with Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese forms of fascism or semi-fascism, led many critics to repudiate Quadrigesimo Moano's formula for the reconstruction of the social order. That is objectively an understandable and salutary fear, but in my opinion, it should not intimidate us from thinking through in very practical and pragmatic American terms the implications of Pope John Paul II's emphasis on the economic role of free and autonomous unions in the proper ordering of economic life. It might be useful in this regard to revisit John XXIII's encyclical Moderate Magistra. John carefully avoided giving his approval to any particular form of organizing or reorganizing economic life. Moreover, even his terminology was different from that of Pius XI in Quadrizesa Moano and in Pius XI's later encyclical Divini Redem Torres. Pius XI used the terminology of corporativism, which in English was translated generally into the term industry council plan. For John XXIII, on the other hand, but John XXIII, on the other hand, was mostly preoccupied with the practical aspects of the problem and so carefully avoided using this kind of terminology. He was writing as a pastor and not as a jurist. He knew all about the discussions raised by the formulas of Pius XI and Pius XII and the misunderstandings that these discussions had caused. So he kept from formalizing, or formalizing and even went so far as to avoid using the, the, the words corporatism, corporation, or corporative organization. It would appear to be partially correct then to say that John XXIII was less interested than was Pius XI in what came to be known in this country as the Industry Council Plan. Pope John's approach to the problem of social reconstruction and his terminology were less theoretical, 
more flexible, if you will, than that of Pius the, tw the 11th. But it would be a mistake, I think, to conclude that John was any less interested than was Pius the 11th in the basic principles of social reconstruction under underlying the so-called Industry Council Plan. These principles I would summarize as follows. First, economic order will not come naturally only by free competition, free enterprise, and free initiative, although a maximum degree of freedom must always be safeguarded. Intermediate bodies are natural and necessary if we want to avoid state totalitarianism, but not for that reason alone. Institutional cooperation at all levels must be organized between the agents of the economy. Intermediate bodies must cooperate among themselves and with the government in order to help it play its positive role in the economy for the common good, national and international. These are the basic principles, as I see them, underlying the Industry Council Plan. Pope John did not tell us in detail how he thought they should be put into practice. His approach, I repeat, was very flexible. He opened the doors to all kinds of institutional cooperation among those involved at the different levels of production, strongly insisting that any organization of the economy must take into account the national and international common good. The state has a positive role to play, he said, and this role must be carried out with respect for legitimate autonomies and with the participation of all involved groups. In substance, this is what the proponents of the Industry Council Plan had been saying all along. At times, perhaps, their approach and their terminology were inflexible and were too reminiscent of the wrong kind of corporativism as we came to experience it in fascist countries in Europe. If so, moderate magistrate can serve as a timely corrective. One way of moving in the direction of a better reorganization would be to develop a pragmatic system of American-style co-management and co-determination and new forms of profit-sharing and co-ownership. I don't hear any of the candidates for office talking in these terms at the present time. I have not heard the word co-ownership or co-management mentioned in any of the debates or in any of the discussions. I have not read it mentioned anywhere. In my judgment, however, it would be fatuous to talk theoretically about developing new experiments of this kind unless and until there is a reasonably broad consensus in the United States that free and autonomous unions are, in the language of Laporum Exertions, indispensable, his word, especially in highly industrialized economies such as our own. As I have already indicated, however, no such consensus exists at the present time, quite the contrary. Because on the basis of my own experience during the past 50 years, I happen to feel very strongly on this subject, I will say no more about it for fear of appearing to ride my hobby horse into the ground. Suffice to say in summary that in my judgment, the current decline in union membership of the United States and the apparent and very paradoxical lack of concern about this phenomenon on the part of so many who, to, who theoretically attach so much importance to intermediate structures are cause for deep concern. I take my lead in this regard from the writings of the late Monsignor John A. Ryan, widely regarded as the greatest single figure in the history of the Catholic social movement in the United States. At the beginning of the Great Depression, in the late 20s and early 30s, Ryan wrote, quotes, that effective labor unions are still by far the most powerful force in society for the protection of the laborer's rights and the improvement of his or her condition. No amount of employer benevolence, no diffusion of sympathetic attitude on the part of the public, no increase of beneficial legislation, however necessary that may be, can adequately supply for the lack of organization among workers themselves. I would add in this context that neither can the great proliferation of post-Vatican II church-related justice and peace programs adequately supply for the lack of organization among workers themselves. These words are as true today as when they were first written more than a half century ago. Having briefly addressed the principle of subsidiarity, let me say a word in passing about the correlative principle of socialization. Not socialism, but socialization as the term is used in Bader Magistra, a term which acknowledges and even recommends a positive role for the government in promoting social justice. To neglect the implications of this principle in the corpus of Catholic social teaching arises in part, I think, from our, explains in part, I think, our having gotten bogged down too often in, in, a, in an ideological debate in the United States about capitalism versus socialism. A prominent American banker, New York banker, who happens to be a very serious and forward-looking student of Catholic social teaching, trenchantly addressed this subject in a paper he delivered last June at a major conference on the centenary of Ram Navarum at the University of San Francisco. He said that recent breathtaking developments in Eastern Europe have provided us with an opportunity to take a fresh look at capitalism. This time, he says, we can 
do so unencumbered by the baggage of the past. By that he means that the examination need no longer involve the issue, theoretical issue, of capitalism versus communism. Instead, the examination can sharpen its focus on ways to make market-based economics work even better in terms of meeting broad human needs, both material and spiritual. In a sense, he says, communism had been a rather convenient thing to have around. Its existence served to simplify the debate, narrow the options, and discourage rigorous examination. Subtleties were frequently not allowed. Attempts at meaningful discourse were often enfeebled by the hardening of the categories. In short, he concluded, with one debate seemingly resolved, we can now focus our energy and our attention on eliminating the significant faults and inadequacies of, cap inadequacies of capitalism which we know to exist, while at the same time preserving those special properties that imbue the markets with their special genius. I hope he's right about that, for heaven knows we have been bogged down long enough in an either, either or black and white debate about capitalism versus some kind of socialism or communism. During the long Cold War between the Communist East and the so-called capitalist West, we had a plausible excuse for, for diverting so much of our energy to this debate, even though the, de the debate was sometimes oversimplified and often reflected national and geopolitical rivalries rather than pure principle. Unfortunately, however, the debate, at least in the United States, turned into an argument not only about Soviet-style communism versus Western-style capitalism, but also about democratic capitalism versus democratic socialism. It is regrettable, I think, that the debate so often took such an ideological turn. I say this among other reasons because both democratic capitalism and democratic socialism carry so much partisan baggage and are fraught with such ambiguity that they have become all too often little more than shibboleths. And while shibboleths are fun to argue about, they are less meaningful even to intellectuals and much less useful to economic practitioners in the unsettled 90s than those who are ideolog ideologically stuck with them seem to think they are. What is needed at this stage in our history, I think, is a non-ideological objective study of the U.S. economy based in the words of the banker whom I quoted a moment ago at eliminating the significant faults and inadequacies of capitalism which we know to exist, while at the same time preserving those special properties that imbue the markets with their special genius. It is cause for rejoicing, I think, that this kind of non-ideological pragmatic re-examination of the U.S. economic system is belatedly underway, very belatedly underway, in the healthcare field, to cite but one example. Until a few years ago, as I remember very vividly from spending almost all my life in Washington, debate about health care in the United States was a fruitless exercise in simplistic ideological rhetoric. Any program, no matter how modest, aimed at giving the government a significant role in the, re in the restructuring of the health care system was labeled socialized medicine. Year after year, it was the same old irrelevant debate about free market capitalism versus socialism. And all the while, the health care system kept going from bad to worse. At present time, I think it is almost universally agreed the system is so bad that it can only be described as a national crisis. Fortunately, the debate has recently taken a turn for the better. To cite but one out of many examples, the New York Times reported just a few months ago in a major story that a survey on health care taken among chief executives of the nation's largest corporations found that 91% of them said that a fundamental change or a complete rebuilding of the health care system was needed. The survey also found that 73% of the executives, and these were top CEOs, said that the problem could not be resolved by corporations working on their own. A majority said that some degree of government intervention was necessary. The New York Times summary of this survey was carried in the business section of the paper. In my opinion, it merited front page coverage for its implications for the future are almost revolutionary. Common sense is beginning to displace sterile capitalism versus socialism rhetoric in the debate about the crisis in health care. Drastic astronomical increases in the cost of the health care system have now convinced the majority of corporate executives that something must be done without delay. After trying and failing to get a grip on medical costs themselves, they have realistically accepted the idea, which they once thought to be heretical, that change must be national, not piecemeal or local. At a minimum, they see an important role for the government in restructuring the system, although understandably they don't want the government to run the entire system. Moreover, an increasing number of corporate executives are now prepared to cooperate with organized labor and other interested parties in hammering out the details of a viable national solution to a problem which is now completely out of hand. 
This is revolutionary, and I repeat, in my opinion, is cause for rejoicing. I take it that it is one of the purposes of our conferences during the centenary year of Ram Novaram to um, ask ourselves in practical terms to address ourselves in one way or another to the challenge put forth by the banker I've been quoting, namely the challenge to eliminate the significant faults and inadequacies of capitalism which we know to exist, while at the same time preserving those special properties that imbue the markets with their special genius. We will not be alone in addressing this challenge. Contrary to the conventional wisdom of recent decades, we are unexpectedly witnessing a revival of interest in Catholic social teaching, as witnessed, for example, the phenomenally widespread observance here in the United States of the anniversary of Aaron of Arm. I would say, on the basis of my own experience, looking back over 50 years, no one could have anticipated, certainly no one did anticipate, no one predicted, that the centenary of Ram Navarm would be celebrated as intensively and as widespreadly as it has been in the United States during the past year. I began my remarks by quoting from an article by my former colleague, Father John Kuhn. Let me quote again from that article in closing. About 1966, Kuhn wrote, there developed a sudden and dramatic turning away from the traditional methods of Catholic social teaching and Catholic social action. Encyclical courses were dropped from the curriculum of colleges and seminaries. Even updated books based on the social magisterium ceased to sell. I might interpolate here to say that was the plaintive cry of a man whose books were on reminder. reminder. He had, John Conan had written several textbooks that they obviously were no longer selling when he wrote this. He went on to say that prediction is hazardous, hazardous but it seems that the golden age of Catholic social teaching begin in eight, beginning in 1891 had ended by 1971. I feel certain that Father Cronin, who unfortunately has been an invalid for many years, but is still of sound mind, would be more than happy to concede that history has invalidated this prediction. Happy, that is to say, to observe in his declining years that the so-called golden era of Catholic social teaching, far from having ended in 71, seems to be alive and well. Thank you very much. Mind, I'm going to sit down during the question period, but I have a bad hip. Yes? A question. What is a, a could you give us a little bit Well, what generally, what the people who use the term, they mean the family, they mean the unions, they mean uh, church bodies, private schools, structures which are below the state, but have a role to play in society, which are antecedent to the state, really, as the family is, obviously, as, as religion is. But a union in the economic order would be a, what they would call a mediating structure. It's between the individual and the state. Uh, yes. Co-ops and grain movements. Co-ops, yes. All sorts of things in the economic and social field. Yes? Why, why is the American labor movement, American unions, I should say, why are they on the rocks in the last 20 years? Well, I think for a variety of reasons, which would take a smarter man than myself and more time than I have to, to explain. Whole whole variety of reasons. One is the changing structure of the global economy. Take, for example, the auto industry, uh, an industry that I follow more closely than most industries. Up until quite recently, the only cars you saw on the street in the United States were American cars, unless some rich man was driving a Rolls Royce or an expensive German car. Today, what, 20, 30 percent or more, perhaps, of the cars you see are made in Japan or Korea. You have a totally new global economy, uh, which you did not have in See, in the days of Walter Ruther when he was president of the UAW, the, U the UAW used to be a completely, almost fan fan fanatically in favor of free trade. No president of the auto workers could survive today politically if he repeated the statements they made about free trade back in the, in the 40s and the 50s because the world has changed so fast. Secondly, within our own economy, we've gone rapidly and permanently into a service economy rather than a manufacturing economy. The majority of the new jobs that, um, that are being created today are in the service trades, not in manufacturing. Pittsburgh, which um, historically has been synonymous with the word steel, there's no steel made in Pittsburgh today. Not, not an ounce of steel is made in Pittsburgh. And yet as you go around the world, if you say Pittsburgh, people immediately think steel. 
the, the whole manufacturing base has been corroded. And we've gone into low paying, largely low paying service jobs. Geographically, much of the, um, of the um, movement of the United States has gone to uh, states which are more difficult to organize, right to work states in the South, for example. There's been a geographical spread. All kinds of reasons, uh, and the political atmosphere. When Reagan put the um, air controllers out of business, I think he clearly gave a signal that it was a popular thing to do to be unfriendly to organized labor, and people took the signal. There has been strong organized opposition to the, the organizing of new workers in large segments of the American economy, including in some of our Catholic institutions, I might add, and the atmosphere is, is very unfriendly. But there are a whole variety of reasons. The one reason I think that